What the heck is a server action? And why do I even need them if Next.js has API routes? Won't they just make my code an entangled mess and break the engineering principle called separation of concerns? Or even worse, is Next.js becoming PHP? Have you been losing sleep lately over these questions? If so, I've got you covered. In this video, not only will I answer these questions, but I will also guide you in building an app that answers them in a practical way so you can finally understand what server actions are, how they work, and how to use them in your apps. We'll build and deploy a responsive anime website that shows an infinite list of various anime with framer motion and using Next.js server-side features. And before we build it, let's do a quick crash course on server actions. Even before the crash course, I need to let you know that the Black Friday sale on the Ultimate Next.js 14 course is here. You can get 30% off the original price and it even stacks with regional pricing. Also, we just added two special bonuses to the course. One, a guide to advanced features, powerful libraries, and robust security practices in Next 14. And the other, most common Next.js FAQs answered. Both of these bonuses offer short and precise explanations with the ability to dig deeper into it with mini projects. So if you want to enroll, check it out before the Black Friday sale ends this Monday and join over 2,300 developers who have already joined and adore it. Go to jsmastery.pro forward slash next 14 or click the link in the description to enroll. But with that said, back to the crash course. Not that long ago, right after the release of server components, Next.js released server actions. Server actions are functions that run on the server, but we can call them like any other normal JavaScript functions. To create these server actions, all you have to do is use the use server flag. So a common example of server actions you may have seen on the internet might look something like this. There is a client component called app in which we have a form that's calling request username function, which seems to be using that use server flag. So a client component is making a call to a function that is stored inside of a server. What the heck is happening here? It means that this isn't just a function call. A request was actually made to the Next.js API to call that function. It's just that we can't see them as Next.js hides it for us. So let me take you to the deployed side of the application you'll build in this video. You see, after the initial load, so the first time the site loads the next data, in the network tab, you'll see localhost. Click on it and you'll notice that it's a post request with some payload and it's specified as next action. Under the hood, whatever we write inside a function labeled as use server is turned into an API with the post method. That sounds a bit confusing, right? Not a lot of people talk about this, but today you and I are gonna dig deeper. In short, we're doing this. We're making a regular fetch API call from client to server, but Next.js abstracts that from us. So you might think, if both are the same thing, why should I ever use server actions? Well, first of all, your code is gonna have less code, right? We need to write a lot more code for an API route versus a server action. With server actions, we focus on the business logic, getting data from the form and doing the database operations. With API, you not only have to make a request from a client yourself, but you also need to create an API on the server where you listen to these requests from a client, double the work. Also, there's no API. We don't have to create any kind of APIs with server actions since Next.js will handle it automatically for us. That's great. But this is also a problem with server actions. As you have seen, all that server actions basically do is make a post request but we don't really have control over that request. Next.js does it for us. So we could run into some compatibility issues in case you're developing apps on desktop or mobile. 
In that case, using server actions doesn't make sense, at least right now. That's because updating a server action endpoint multiple times for desktop and mobile and web is both risky and unnecessary. Hopefully, Vercel does something about that soon. But if you develop just web apps, you should be good. Another reason why we want to use server actions is that they are going to result in less client-side code. Now that we're handling the database calls or business logic directly, we can ship less client-side code. This would mean that server actions would work even if someone disables client-side JavaScript. To show you what I mean, let me take you back to the app we're building today. For now, I will comment out frame or motion animation on the cards as they do need client-side browser interactions. But once we disable that, everything is server-side. So we can open up developer tools, disable JavaScript from preferences, and reload. You'll see that we can still see the first few elements of the page. Isn't that cool? But what about that infinite spinner? Well, it won't show up as its logic depends on browser functionality. It's a pure client component. So what's the point of all of this? Well, understanding this means that we're shipping less client-side code. Offloading the burden of processing client data will mean our pages will load faster, they'll respond better, and thus server engines will favor them. It will further improve core web vitals, crawl budget, crawl ranking, and ultimately the user experience. If your website works well, it could also mean more people doing what we want them to do, like buying something or signing up. And finally, another big pro of using server actions is improved DX, which stands for developer experience. By directly focusing on the business logic, we can ship code faster and therefore benefit ourselves with some well-needed rest or downtime, like watching anime, reading books, or playing some games or even the client or company you are working for, as you'll be able to develop things faster in a better way. But even after all of this, you still might have some questions. Let me take a guess. Are you wondering if there is only one way of using server actions, like through client components? The answer is no. We can use server actions inside server components as well. How? Well, the same way as before. We declare a server component. As you can see, we don't have the use client at the top. And we simply fetch a use server action called fetch anime. Now, you might be thinking, wouldn't that be a post method from a server component for fetching anime? Well, let's go back to our application and see what's happening. If you open up the network tab and find localhost again, you'll see that it's a get method where we're getting the whole HTML page. So since the function we're using is a server action and so is our whole component page, it's a server component, everything gets executed on the server side and turned into an HTML page, which is then served to the user. In this case, the client, it all happens on the server. But if you notice the very first infinite scroll loader and see the network tab, you'll see that indeed it is a post method requesting another set of documents from our API. This infinite scroll loader is a client component where we're calling the same server action. We'll see that live in a few minutes. But the whole point was that you can still use server actions to get a list of data. However, they're more powerful than that. Server actions allow you to do mutations, meaning create, update, and delete actions on top of the typical read together making up the complete CRUD operation set. Oof, that was a lot, right? But hopefully now you have a better idea of how server actions work, at least in theory. But finally, the moment you've been waiting for is here. Let's see how we can use those server actions in both client and server components, as we've learned, as well as implement infinite scroll and use framer motion on top of that. Grab a cup of coffee and let's do it. Now, as I've hinted at the start, to demonstrate all of these great Next.js concepts and features, you'll build Anime Vault. Now, whether you are an anime fan or not, it doesn't really matter. Think of these as cards, as documents of sorts, some data that's coming back from a database that you have to load in a nice manner and then animate. Notice how smooth it is, 
they slowly load one after another and you can keep scrolling indefinitely. That's what you'll build. And on top of this, you'll be able to learn great concepts. So not to waste any of your time and to focus on what truly matters, which is mastering infinite scrolling, server actions, and more, I prepared the entire repo here for you with three different branches. To get started, you'll download just the main branch, which for now just has some static data right here. No API integration, no logic, no server actions, nothing. And then together, we're going to build on top of that. So go to code, download it using GitHub Desktop, or simply copy this URL. Once you do that, open up an empty Visual Studio Code editor, go to View, and then Terminal. Then type git clone, paste the link, and then type the folder name. In this case, we can do anime vault. Press Enter. It's going to clone it. Press CD, anime vault, move into it, and then type code dot. This is going to open up a new Visual Studio Code window right there. You can close the old one and make this go full screen. As you can see, this is a typical Next.js application. Here we have the app folder, which is the most important folder of our Next.js app. For you specifically, I have also prepared the underscore data.ts, which is a simple array of about 20 or so animes right here. After that, we also have our favicon, we have our globals.css, and then we have our layout. Within the layout, we import the hero as well as the footer. Hero is typically known as a header, the first thing that you see inside of an application. We have a font, some metadata, and we just show the children within it. Here, the children typically refers to whichever page we're currently on. And in this case, it's always going to be this page right within the app, as that's the only page that we have. Right now, it might be a bit hard to read because there's a lot of red squiggly lines happening. So what do you say that we open up our terminal and then run npm install? This is going to install all of our dependencies. And when I say all of our dependencies, it sounds a bit scary because it sounds like there's too many, but there really is not. If you go to our package.json, you can notice that this is as bare bones as it gets. We have React version 18, React DOM 18 as well, and then Next.js 14 plus, as well as some dev dependencies like TypeScript. So we're gonna do this all from scratch. Now, another thing that might look a bit weird, and let me zoom this out a bit, is that we have those three dots right here. This is a cool new extension that I found that hides your Tailwind classes when you don't wanna see them, but only when you click them, it's going to show them to you. In case you're wondering, the name of the extension is inline fold. Great. With that said, let's go ahead and run npm run dev. And let's press control click to open it up on localhost 3000. And we are ready to explore the diverse realms of anime magic. Or are we? If we scroll down, we can see all of the anime here, but can we really? As you can see, we have this loader here and it seems like our app is broken, but it's not really broken. It's just waiting for you to learn how to do server actions and then implement them on this app and hopefully many, many more in the future. So that's exactly what we're going to do next. We're going to transition our app from this basic demo data onto real API data fetching using server actions. So to start implementing our server actions, we're going to create a new file called action.ts right here within our app. Within here, I'm going to use the use server directive. This means that whatever is written in this code will be executed as a server action. Then the only thing this file is going to have is going to be one function, const fetch anime. And then it's going to be just a typical arrow function. This function is going to have only one goal, and that is to make a call to the API and return the data. So we can say something like const response is equal to a wait. Of course, since we're using a wait, we have to make this function asynchronous. And we can say fetch. 
fetch is just a built-in JavaScript function to fetch data from APIs or websites. And we can pass in a URL which we want to fetch from. In this case, we can type it out together. It's going to be HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash Shikimori. Okay, that's a good one. Dot one forward slash API forward slash animes with an S at the end. And this is it. This is the bare bones API. So let's try fetching this first and see what it returns. We can do a cons data is equal to await response dot JSON. Whenever you're using fetch, you have to run the dot JSON to extract the data from it. And finally, we can return the data as simple as it gets. Now let's immediately console.log the data right here before we return it. Our app is running on localhost 3000. We are using this fetch anime, but we're not gonna see any kind of console log because we have to use it somewhere. This right here is just a function declaration, not a function call. So that means that we have to export this function by running the export keyword in front. Then we can use it somewhere and in this case, it's going to be within our primary homepage right here. So what we can do at the top is say const data is equal to await fetch anime, and we can immediately import it right so and make a call. Or even simpler, for now, we don't even have to declare it to a specific piece of data, we can just call it. That's the only thing we want because we're after this console log of data. So let's open up our terminal. And immediately you can see that it called the API and it returned, I think the first anime that's there, just a single one with the ID, or maybe it's even a random one. So if I do it another time, now it gives me the same one. So it returns the first one in a list, but now we wanted to give some additional pieces of data right here. So let's modify our API call. We can do that by passing some query parameters. You can do that by adding the question mark and then say page is equal to, for now we can set it to one, but we can be smart ahead of time and immediately know that this is going to be some kind of a function parameter that's going to be coming into this function. So we can say page of a type number. And then here, now we can turn this into a template string and we can use this variable off page. Alongside page, we also want to pass limit. So we can say and limit is equal to, and then we can define the max limit. We can do it right here within the code, set it to something like eight. Now, if you save the file, the formatter is nicely going to put it in a new line. And the last parameter that we need is and order is equal to popularity. So now if we open up the terminal once again and go back to page and you can see TypeScript is immediately saving us from some trouble later on. It lets us know that it expected one argument, but got zero, an argument for page was not provided. Once again, I know that some of you don't like using TypeScript too much, but you can see how even in simpler apps, it starts paying off because it lets you know that something is wrong. So let's pass number one as the page that we are after. Let's save it. And if you open it up, you can see invalid parameter page value one and limit eight must be a number between one and this is 100,000. So let's see why that is happening. It looks like I used a dollar sign right here instead of an end sign. So we definitely want to fix that. And now we're good. And as you can see, we get eight anime from the page one. This is great. We're getting some data. So now instead of simply console logging that data, we of course want to return it, which is exactly what we are doing right here. So going back to our page, we can now remove this declaration of getting the fake data. And we can indeed say const data is equal to await fetch anime. This time we're going to render the anime cards. So if we go back and reload, you can see that something is happening. So let's fix it. We can see that our page is rendering the anime card to which we're passing the index. And it would be nice of us to define the type for this as well. In this case, number. With that said, we know we're passing the entire item to our anime card. So if we move into it, 
we can see where we're rendering the image. In this case, if you open up your terminal, you can see that image has the original, but this is only the end of the path. We're still missing the entire start of the API, meaning the domain name. So to modify it, we can make this a template string that starts with HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash Shikimori dot one. And then we can put this as the dynamic part of this template string and close it like so. If we now save this and go back, the images are back. So now what we have done so far is we have received the first eight images, this time from the real API, but now is where the magic is going to happen. We have to make this infinite loading work to render more anime cards as we scroll down. Now let's go where the magic happens. And that is not the anime card, not the homepage, not even the server action, but it is our component called load more. Yep, inside of this component, we're going to load more pages as they come. And yes, I use the word page, even though technically nowhere on the screen, you can see numbers of pages, but still the premise is the same. We paginate normally as you usually would, but this time as we scroll down, we load a new page. So the idea is still the same, but it's how we approach it that differs. So the primary difference here is instead of clicking the next button, we're going to trigger the next page once we scroll down to a specific point of the screen. In this case, to the end of the screen. And the question now is, how are we going to know how far our user has scrolled? Thankfully, there is a phenomenal NPM package that has over 1.3 million weekly downloads that does that for us. The only thing we have to do is install it and then just use in view. That's about it. It's going to tell us once we reach a specific point. So going back to our app, we can open up our terminal. Without stopping this one, I can press this icon here to open up another one side by side. And then I can run npm install react dash intersection dash observer. This is a really lightweight package and it's only a helper to do what we need to do. Everything else you'll do on your own. So now that we have it, how do we use it? Well, you can simply say import use in view, and that's going to be coming from react intersection observer. How to use it? Well, you just call it right here, const, it gives us a ref and it gives us an in view property, which is equal to use in view. That's it. Now, see how this starts with use, which means that it is a hook. So now if we were to save this file, our app would broke. And I knew that even before I clicked save. Why? Well, that's because you cannot use hooks on the server side. So that means that we have to convert our component to be a client side component by giving it a use client directive. Now our page works and still the entire page is server side rendered. Only this little button is rendered on the client side. Now we want to attach this ref to something. We want to attach it to this div at the bottom by giving it a ref equal to ref. So now it's going to know once we scroll to it. So let's figure out how it works. Once the ref has reached, something happens. So let me demonstrate. We're going to use the use effect hook right here, which is usually getting run once something happens, right? So we can declare a typical callback function right here with a dependency array that's going to track the changes in the in view variable. And we of course have to import use effect coming from react, which we can do right here at the top by saying import use effect coming from react. Great. So now in here, we can put a simple alert saying load more, which is exactly what we want to do. But there's one more thing we have to do. We have to wrap this alert with the if in view property. So only if we are in view, then we want to load more, or in this case, just alert that we do want to load more. So now if we go here and if we slowly scroll down, once we hit that scroll bar, you're going to notice that we got an alert load more, which makes it a perfect time 
to load the next page of our anime cards. So how are we going to do it? Well, right here, we can call the same server action we have created before, fetch anime, coming from at forward slash app forward slash action. We can call it, and we need to pass a page number. In this case, it's going to be two, right? Then we can use the dot then to get a response. We can call it res. And then we want to update the data that we want to show, which we can use the state for. So here we can say use state and use that state snippet, call it data and set data, which is at the start going to be equal to an empty array. And of course we have to import use state coming from react. Now, once we get the response, we can simply say set data. And here's the thing. We not only want to update the data, but we want to keep track of all of the data we've had before. So for that reason, we want to return an array, spread all of the existing data, and then to it, add all of the data from the response by spreading it by saying dot 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 res. Now TypeScript is going to complain that we cannot add these elements to a simple array. So let's define the type as well, which we can do here by using this syntax and then say anime prop, which we can import automatically from that slash anime card and say we want to get an array of anime props. This way, TypeScript knows exactly what it's getting. While we're here, we can also see that our linter is complaining that it's missing data as a prop. So yes, if the data changes, we do want to recall this use effect. So we can add it to the dependency array. And now there's one point I want to make. We are already fetching this data on the homepage. You can see we're using the fetch anime and then we display it. But in load more, we want to display page two, three, four, and so on. So to do that, we can simply copy this entire section from the homepage and then paste it right here inside of this React fragment. And then of course, don't forget to import the anime card. So this section is for all of the subsequent pages from page one. Okay, let's now save it. And let's check it out in the browser. Going back to the website, we of course know that our first page is already here, but as we scroll down, Let's see what happens. Oh, you saw the new line appeared and then another new line, which means eight new anime, which is exactly equal to the second page. But now as we scroll further, you're going to start noticing that the images repeat. So that's not quite good, right? To fix that, we have to implement a new variable, which is page. We have to keep track of the page we're currently on. So let's declare it right here at the top of our component, let page, and we're going to start with a number two. So what is the exact reason why we put it outside and not as a state here? Well, you might have as well use the use state snippet and then just use the page and set page. But in this case, it's not even necessary. We can have just a simple variable and update it as we normally would. So here, Below the data, once we get to the end, we can actually increment the page by one. And here we can use the real page number. So every time that we get into a new view, we can show and fetch a new page. So let's test it out. Back on our page, I'm going to scroll down first, second, and then we have third, fourth, and so on. So this is actually working but it seems like nothing is happening because it just loads instantly. If I go a bit faster, you can see loading, but then that doesn't look so good, which is the exact reason why we want to implement some animations. So now would be the perfect time to do that. To add animations to our simple app, we're going to use Framer Motion, the most popular animation library for React and Next.js. But there are many questions on how to use this with Next.js. Considering that everything is server-side rendered and we want that, how can we achieve these client-side rendered animations? How can we get the best of both worlds? Well, that's exactly what I'm going to teach you right now. So let's open up the terminal one more time and let's run npm install framer-motion, the second and the last package we're going to use in this video. 
Now that we have it, we can navigate over to our anime card because we want to apply that animation directly to each individual card. But we have a couple of problems here. In React, doing that would be super simple. But in Next.js, due to the fact that we're using server-side rendering, it gets a bit tougher. Let me explain why. The way you would use Framer Motion would be simple. You would just say import motion from Framer Motion. And this exposes all the elements that you can use like divs and images, but they're animated. So now if you want to turn this div into an animated div, what you could do is just say motion.div and then you can provide it a couple of props. They're going to make it all work. So in this case, those props are going to be as simple as saying variance is equal to variance. And we can define them right here at the top by saying const variance is equal to hidden opacity zero like this and visible opacity one. So we want to shift it from zero to one. We also want to give it the initial state, which is going to be set to hidden. We want to give it the animate, which is going to be visible. So the only thing this is doing is it's going from opacity zero to opacity one. And then we can define the transition by saying transition is equal to delay is going to be set to let's do 0.1 seconds or let's do one. So it's really obvious. We can also do ease, which is going to be ease in out the way that the animation happens. And then we can also add a duration, which is going to be 0.5 seconds. Finally, there's one additional thing that we can add, which is called a viewport, which in this case is going to be set to zero. Now, if we save this and go back to our application, you can see that we get an error. And this is something that I always like to point your attention to. We are within a server side component because we have never said use client, but apparently something is trying to use context, which is not going to work with a server rendered component. And I'm going to turn this div into a new component, which we're going to create. So even though our app is not working right now, let's fix it. We can fix it by creating a new component right here called motion div dot TSX. Inside of here, we're going to import what made us switch the client side anyway. So that's going to be import motion from framer motion. And we know that for this, we have to turn it into a client side component. So we can say use client. The only thing we're going to do here is we're going to export const motion div is equal to motion dot div. So now the only thing that is client side rendered is this specific div, nothing else in this anime card. So this parent element right here is going to be client side rendered and everything else is going to be children, which are still going to be server side rendered. So what we can do now is we can replace this with this motion div, which we can import from that slash motion div, and we can keep all of the other props the same. And now if we go back, the app again works, the animations work as well. But if you pay close attention, there's no use client directive on top of the anime card, just a little one right here where we export the functionality from Framer Motion. Now our animations are still not perfect. And we can verify that by putting our browser side by side to our code. Now, if we reload the page, you can notice that there's nothing and then they all appear at once. This is not what we want to do. So thankfully, let's verify where are we calling the anime card from? We're calling it in two places. We're calling it from the home page where we pass the index of the element we're loading. And we're also calling it from load more where we're also passing the index of that specific card. So we can do a little bit of a trick right here. We can accept that index as props into our anime card, and we can stagger the animations from every subsequent card. First of all, delay is going to be equal to index times, and then a specific number, for example, 0.25 seconds. 
So now to load the first card, it's going to take zero seconds because the index is zero. The second one is going to be 0 0.25 seconds. Next one is going to be 0 0.5 and you get the idea. So now if we just reload, you can see the first one loads and then all of the others follow. This is great. Now you might think that this is working and it is, but if you start scrolling really, really far down, you're gonna notice that it's gonna take so much time for these items to actually load. Now you can see they're loading, but they're really, really slow. So there's a little thing that we can do to fix it. That's because our staggering element right here is applying to the entirety of the elements we're getting back. So it's going to take more and more time to load them. So what we can do is only apply the stagger for that specific batch or that specific page of elements that come back. In this case, what we can do is go back to our action.ts. And instead of it returning just the data, it can return the components themselves. So let's go to our home and let's copy this entire data.map right here. We can then go here and paste it. Return data.map anime card. Then you're gonna notice that we have a lot of warnings and that's because we are in a TS file, but since we're using some components, we have to rename it to TSX right here. And then we have to import the anime card from components anime card, as well as the anime prop from components anime card. Great. So now instead of just returning the data, we're returning the presentation of that data as well. So there's just two little things we'll have to do. We'll have to go back to the page and we don't wanna map over it two times. Now our data actually already is the content that we wanna display. So the only thing we have to do is fetch the data right here and then just dynamically render it because we're already mapping over it. And we have to repeat the same thing for our load more component. If we go here, we don't have to map over the data anymore. We just have to render it because the data is already getting mapped over within our server action. Now TypeScript is complaining that it's no longer getting what it should get. So what we can do is we can just modify the type by saying export type. This time we are gonna call it anime card is equal to jsx.element. And now we can replace the anime prop with anime card. And if we save it, we're good. The data is here. I can close my code and I can expand my browser so we can admire it in its full glory. Now I'm going to slowly scroll down. We're gonna see that the elements will indeed start getting animated. I'm gonna scroll a bit faster so we can admire all the animations as well. There we go. How cool is this? Everything is getting animated. We can see new posts appear. This is amazing. But of course, it's our code that makes it possible. So if we go back, I wanna give you a quick recap of what we have done. Everything is happening right here within our action.tsx where we fetch the data and then we return it. You can either return it just as data or in this case, we're immediately returning it as a mapped over page. And we can know that this is a server action because we have the use server directive on top. Now we're using this server action in two places. We're using it right within our homepage, which is, bear with me, another server page because it doesn't have the use client directive. We just normally call it right here and it works like a charm. Then we can go to the other place where we're using it. It's going to be within components, load more. And now check this out. Load more is a use client directive page, meaning a client side rendered page. And we still normally call this fetch anime the same server action we're calling in the same way within our server rendered page, which means that we can call server actions both within client and server rendered pages. They're just so powerful. Finally, you learn how to use this in view property. So once we scroll down, we refetch the entire page and display it. You learn that infinite scroll is nothing more than just going over the next page and next page whenever we go down. It's like clicking the next button for you. And you also learned how to use framer motion within server-side rendered pages. We have it right here. 
the only thing you have to do is apply the US client directive here, export that div, and then all the children within that anime card are going to be server-side rendered, although only the motion div is client-side. A lot of exciting stuff. And this has been kind of a simple application to showcase all of the power of what Next.js has to offer. The creators of Next.js are often releasing these small apps to teach you different concepts. And this is the example they've done for partial pre-rendering. It is super quick and loads incredibly nicely. If you would want me to do more of these simple apps, but then focus more on explaining the concepts, just let me know down in the description. But of course, this is just the beginning. And that little infinite scroll that we had that you can see right here is just one example of phenomenal features that you need to have in almost all of your new modern Next 14 apps, which is exactly why I created a much, much larger project than this one. I'm talking Dev Overflow. This one specifically has pagination, not infinite scroll, but it has many other features. You saw the loading there, you see different layouts, there's even login, even a dedicated job search page. And I cannot go without mentioning the ability to create your own stack or flow questions, count answers and views, have code blocks, answers to those code blocks, and then even the ability to generate an AI answer. And yes, you can learn all of this by enrolling into our ultimate Next.js 14 course, which right now is on a crazy Black Friday sale, but no matter when you're watching this video, we always have regional discounts turned on as well. It is the best course right now that is completely up to date that can teach you everything you need to know about Next.js to use it like these companies do. It's more than just using it like React. You cannot use it like React. You have to embrace all of the server-side principles like we did today with server actions and more, and then truly use it the way it's supposed to be used. And just a note, this entire application is built entirely on server actions. So if you wanna learn them in more depth, this is the best way to do that and also learn how to make your app SEO optimized and performant. The entire course has a lot of deep dive lectures with special animations like this to better understand the concepts. We have the build and deploy of the dev overflow and finally, we have active lessons. These are special lessons that test your knowledge where you have to develop a feature with our guidance. So are you ready to get started? Just go to jsmastery.pro forward slash next 14 or click the link in the description. I'll see you inside.